A multi-trillion rand economy poised to grow even stronger over the coming years. But who controls it and how many of its citizens have a share in it? Good evening. Welcome to Democracy 30. My name is Oliver Dixon. It's the main talking point that remains highly contested across society as citizens reflect on South Africa's democracy gains. Tonight we ask the question, why does South Africa's economy remain unlargely untransformed 30 years after democracy? Joining us for this discussion is Kanki Matabane, who is the CEO of the Black Business Council, and Kaz Kovaria from the Business Unity South Africa. Uh, we'll, but first, let's watch this insert put together by Nadia Dambuza. The part of the issue of reconciliation and nation building is defined by and derives from the material conditions in our society, which have divided our country into two nations, the one black the other white. We therefore make bold to say that South Africa is a country of two nations. Seen as a controversial speech made four years after the dawn of South Africa's democracy, as the reconciliation project was still at its infancy, former president spoke about one society, one white and one black, characterized by development experiences that differed on the basis of their race. In 1994, the South African economy was skewed in favor of the mainly white minority groups due to deliberate legislation that excluded blacks from opportunities in the labor market and direct ownership of businesses and land. The emphasis must certainly be on uh, liberation, true liberation of the black community, not only politically but also economically. We, are fo we had focused in the past more on political liberation uh, to almost the total exclusion of economic uh, liberation. To remedy this, the post-94 state introduced the BBBEE Act in 2003 to open up opportunities for previously disadvantaged groups, which was followed by the codes of good practices and charters for various industries such as construction, private security, catering and transport. While some black millionaires emerged, the program itself was criticized for empowering a few elites of politically connected black individuals and still leaving a sea of poverty across society. The business sector, on the other hand, has been on the receiving end of criticism for their alleged refusal to transform, with the state being accused of failing to be tough against the sector. According to the government information, as at this year, about 200,000 workers have shared ownership in the companies for which they work, and there's over half a million worker ownership in companies across the South African economy. We observed that the political power that was transferred to the black majority through inclusive election in 1994 was never transformed into economic freedom. Economic freedom has now become a rallying point in political circles as old and new politicians realize that South Africans are losing patience after waiting to see the fruits of democracy. Some believe what this country urgently needs is what they call radical economic transformation. But whatever the term appeals in the evolution of the South African story, it will only resonate with the majority of ordinary South Africans when they find real meaning in their own lives. Nadia Dambuza, Democracy 30. And we're now joined in conversation by Kanke Matabane, who's the CEO of the Black Business Council, as well as Kes Kovaria, who's with Business, Business Unity South Africa. I want to start with you, Kanke, this evening. Who owns South Africa's economy and who controls it, by and large? How much do ordinary citizens have a share in it? Uh, good evening, and thank you very much for for, for invitation. And, and uh, let me say good evening to Kes as well. The <coughs> We are, we, are, we are 30 years into democracy, uh, and, and, and I think it's important to also look at the context of where we come from. Mm. Uh, you know, black people were not allowed to study certain subjects, including mathematics. That allows you to, to study engineering, chartered accountancy, and all those type of things. Uh, and, and, and as such, Black people have been basically excluded from, from, from participating meaningfully in the, in the economy in the past. And then and hence, when democracy started, there were certain instruments that were brought, uh, including employment equity uh, that was, was brought by a uh, former uh, Minister of Labor then, Tito Mpoweni, may his soul rest in peace. 
uh, and, 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 and broad-based black economic empowerment and, and the public procurement legislations that came that time to try and bring black people into the fold. And then 30 years later, uh, we, we have black people owning less than 5% of the economy. We've got uh, almost 70% of the, the uh, CEOs of the JSE listed companies being white males. Uh, and, and, and when we look at the ownership by, 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 by what they call share ownership by employees, mm -hmm. uh, there has been much, some progress there. But, but the, most of those share ownership schemes are also fronting schemes because um, some of the shareholders who are supposed to be shareholders are not necessarily shareholders. They don't have share certificates because if you own a company, you must have a share certificate. Mm. So that there's been a lot of uh, what, what one can call subtle uh, reluctance to, to transform the economy. And, and I think uh, if we don't do anything, it will go on and on and on until the people decide that we've had enough. So our push for economic transformation is informed by the fact that we need to protect the democracy. And, and you can only protect the democracy if you are saying those who were excluded by legislation must be brought into the fold. Mm. Uh, because remember, South Africa is different from Europe and the U.S. where you are trying to include or empower the minority. Uh, mm. When you are trying to power, empower the minority, you can delay as much as you want because they, are, they don't have the numbers to, to, to render the country ungovernable. But if we don't, we keep on excluding the majority, one day they will wake up and say, no, let's render this uh, uh, democracy ungovernable because it does not benefit us. Uh, uh, so. Going back to your issue of a ordinary men on the street, uh, they, 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 they don't have much to, yeah. to, to say because unemployment, if you look at unemployment 30 years into democracy, the majority of the unemployed people, uh, we've got around 75% un youth unemployment, the majority of them are black uh, mm. uh, men and, and women. Mm. Uh, 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 <coughs> anything that is sort of not going okay or negative is mainly the majority of the players there will be black people. Yeah. So it, it shows we are not necessarily bringing them into the fold uh, to, to be owners, managers and controllers of their own economy. Because remember, this is their own country. This, mm. uh, this, uh, uh, but, but they are not participating, unfortunately. Yeah. Guess the rudimentary definition of inequality is the measurement of the distance between the well-off and the disenfranchised. Now, that distance is larger today than it was in 1994, which inadvertently tells us that uh, the well-off have been able to consolidate uh, their means and resources, while the, the disenfranchised have uh, been forced to uh, split the little they have even further amongst each other. Why has it gotten worse for us in the last 30 years? Well, I think it depends on how you look at this. So, so the ownership of the economy by black people is just under about 30%. Because let's remember that many corporates are owned by pension funds, uh, including investment in corporates by the PIC on behalf of the government pension fund. And so indirectly, black people also own companies through those pension funds. Now, why has it gotten worse is that the economy has grown substantially. I mean, we don't have significant growth now. But if one compares it to pre-democracy days, the economy has grown. And, and the, the issue is that with the economy growing, population has also grown. And for a whole range of reasons, we haven't, in the last 10 to 15 years, kept up the, with the economic growth we had in the, let's say, the Tabo Mbeki presidency. And as the economy has contracted in the last, last 10 to 15 years, the ability to create jobs, the ability to actually plow in the sorts of money we need to plow in in social services, including education, including support of SMEs and so on, have decreased. 
On top of that, where, the, where we have had the money, we've mismanaged the money to a great extent during the state capture years. And so we haven't put into place the mechanisms to enable the majority of our people to actually participate in an economy. So we're quite clear as, as BUSA, and we said this time and time again, the work we are doing with government currently in partnership with government in addressing energy issues, logistic issues, and climate corruption issues. It's all to put our country onto a sustainable and inclusive growth path in a way that we make necessary interventions to ensure that all of our people benefit from that economy. The and legislative tools that were brought into the early days of our democracy, such as the Broad-Based Black Economic Empowerment Act, which at the time was just the Black Economic Empowerment Act, the Pro yeah. Public Procurement Preferential Act, uh, the Employment Equity Act, these were all um, pieces of legislature that was at its core, at its heart, was meant to be redressive uh, to the disenfranchisement of pre-democracy South Africa. Have they been helpful and effective legislative tools? I think the legislative tools were necessary because I think, as Hanke said earlier, I'm sorry, Hanke, I didn't even say hello to you, my apologies. As Hanke said earlier, that, that in the apartheid days, the apartheid government intervened legislatively to ensure that the majority of the people in this country did not participate in the economy. So post-democracy, we had to intervene legislatively to ensure that black people started participating in the economy. So I think the legislation, certainly in our view, was necessary. I think in our view, where we fell short is that we didn't concentrate on the broad-based nature of black, black palm. Uh, we, we've had, we have a number of black people, black senior black people that have benefited from this. But if we really wanted to look at broad-based black economic empowerment, we had to ask ourselves the questions, what do we need to do to enable the majority of the yeah. people to benefit from growth? Yeah. And, I, so yeah. I just want to pause you there because, Kanki, I want to put this question to you. You had earlier spoken about a tick-boxing exercise, and to paraphrase it, what you're effectively saying is that what we've had with these pieces of legislation is malicious compliance, compliance for the sake of it, but not compliance in spirit. Talk to us about what that looked like over the last 30 years in practice. <coughs> yeah, th th thanks. I think maybe let me just go to the ownership issue. The 30% the, 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 the is not correct because uh, we're talking about direct ownership. Uh, because why should black ownership be measured through indirect uh, ownership while white people are owning? Such as what? Indirectly? The PIC? Yeah, the PIC is not a or black... Or a pension fund of any sort? Yeah, the PIC is not a black person. Uh, uh, so, so there are white public servants who, 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 who are still benefiting from the PIC. So PIC cannot be classified as black. So we are talking about direct black ownership of the economy. But uh, <coughs> that was said by the way. The, 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 the challenge is that those who have are very reluctant to, to give back what they got, whether they got it wrongly or not. Or not. They, they are very reluctant. Hence, we've got this... To give back or to share? Yeah, to share, because it's to share, because this is our country. So, so they, 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 there has been a lot of ticking of boxes. Uh, and then maybe because the legislation itself brought us to here, where we're saying, if you do this, you get so many points. If you do this, you get so many points. So mm. it, became, it becomes almost like a, a compliance. So, so for example, companies will say, no, let's appoint a black woman, and we'll get so many points. And not necessarily uh, ask, let's appoint the best possible candidate who just so happens to be a black woman. Is, is yeah, yeah, and also, also what they do, then they don't give those black people real jobs. Uh, you know, in, in, I, I want us to put a pin in that and come back to that, because <laughs> we were talking earlier about employee share schemes and whether that's a real means of ownership in a company and its future. We continue the conversation on the other side of this. This is Democracy 30. Don't go away. And welcome back to Democracy 30. Tonight we ask the question, 30 years into our democracy, why does South Africa's economy 
remain largely untransformed. Before we go back to the conversation, I want to bring your attention to the next set of data, looking at a graph that gives us a sense of the picture of uh, race and gender split of the ownership of South Africa's economy when you look at JSE listed companies. About 50.8% of the South African uh, ownership of the JSE happens to still be white, male and female. Uh, the rest of it is split between only 21.4% being uh, black male and only 17.8% being black women. But more importantly, I want us to take a look at the BE practice and what that looks like in the following graphic. Perhaps to go and take a look at very specifically uh, the score that uh, one can say at comfortably at this level we're talking about a company that is largely transformed. When we look at black ownership uh, scores of companies, but many of them at level three reach only but a 86 to 75 percent level. If you look at 2023 in particular, that number trickled back, back upwards. But it is also in the other metrics, such as socioeconomic development and enterprise uh, and supplier development, where the real uh, equity lies in, right? And, and, and that is around 76 percent in 2013, um, and 131 companies, rather, and 76 companies, rather, meeting that score uh, in, at, at a level three standard. In, in, in 2023. Kanki, uh, we, we want to perhaps bring your attention to, he, uh, to this. When we talk about BE compliance, we usually think it only means uh, that a company uh, has enough black people. But it's, it's not just about do we have enough black people in management level, in executive management, uh, as directors and perhaps even as sh uh, uh, shareholders, but also are we spending our money with other black companies, such as, for instance, enterprise and supply development and socioeconomic development. Do we, by and large, as South African companies, get that right? You're a member-based organization, so are you, Cass. Uh, are your members getting it right? Yeah, so, so maybe just, just talk about your, the, 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 the graphics that you put there. So we, in our experience, we, we've gone to companies where they say they are level one. And, and when you get into the company, you don't see level one. Uh, the only black person is a driver there and the, and the tea lady, uh, which tells you that, and we've raised this thing with the new Minister of, of, of uh, Trade, Industry and Competition, Mr. Pakstow, that there are BE verification agencies, because this, this information comes from BE verification agencies. Well, in this instance, this very specific data we showed you comes from the Sunlam Transformation Barometer, uh, yeah, but, which, yeah, which is industry standard data. Yeah, but, but the, the levels, uh, the people who are verifying the levels are BE verification agencies. And in, in, in our, our investigation, we've realized that majority of them are, are basically open to the highest bidder. So they come to you and say, you are level four. And you say, no, no, I'm not, I'm not happy. I'm going to the next one. The next one gives you level one. So there's a, there's a big problem with the standardization. You and I, two years ago, you and I sat in a talk uh, by Tiriso Matuna, who had just become the new commissioner of the, of the BE com uh, Commission. You said they're cracking down on that. Do you think it's possible? No, it, it won't be possible with the current capacity that they have. The BE, BE uh, <coughs> Commission doesn't have capacity. They don't have the people in terms of the numbers. They don't have the quality in terms of the capacity and, and the experience and skills. So they, are, they won't be able to get it until they, they are well capacitated with the proper professionals, uh, with the proper skills who can be able to deal with complicated transactions. Because people take complicated transactions there. So if you've got people who don't have skills, they, they won't understand those transactions. So until we, 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 we get the system to work, we are not going to get anywhere because even some of this research uh, is mainly half cooked. We need to get a proper research that okay. is done, that is uh, a holistic. And, and as we speak now in the country, there's no research that is holistic that tells you how much uh, black people own uh, and then all those type of things. So it's important that we need to get back to the basics mm. so that we can then say, is this thing working or not? But at the moment, most of the people are just thumbsucking information instead of coming with the holistic information that says, 30 years into democracy, is this uh, working or not? If it's not working, what do we do? But, but for us, we need to remember, you only have to have 25% plus one share ownership to, to be almost uh, fully compliant. And that was a, is a minimum because remember, black people make up of 92% of the sure. population. So the ownership of the economy must reflect 92% of the uh, population, the 
control, the management must reflect that. Mm. But at the moment, it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, Cass, I want to take your, uh, jog your memory back to two, about two years ago where the JSE uh, sent out a notice to uh, one of its listed companies, which is a major pharmaceutical retailer in South Africa and an FMCG. And they had said, hey, we noticed that you uh, haven't met the minimum standards for one of the categories here, which is around middle and senior management. Uh, you don't have enough black people com em employed over there. Uh, we'll be issuing you with penalties uh, should that not be uh, corrected. The CEO of that company sent out a moratorium, saying, sent out a memo saying they're placing a moratorium on hiring white men Managers. That memo had leaked into the public, um, and that company faced a lot of backlash to the point where the CEO withdrew that memo uh, on, on, on saying that we very specifically have to fill the vacancies we have with black managers. That was a progressive thing on part of that CEO to say, but the, the society said, no, um, this, we're not going to tolerate this, specifically white South Africans uh, that, that led to that sort of backlash. Is there a real willingness for transformation to take place where it's most needed? I think there is a willingness for transformation to take place, and not because, uh, you know, established business people are good guys or good girls. It's because any business person worth his or her salt recognizes that if the majority of the people in this country do not have a stake in this economy, let alone reaching, let alone sustaining 5% growth rate, we can't even reach 5% growth rate. It's, it simply can't be done. Say so businesses in this country, established businesses in this country, have a long-term approach towards their businesses and want their businesses to grow and to survive and to sustain, sustain themselves over the medium to long term, transformation is absolutely critical. Okay, now, I, I have a view on this and, and in, in reply to your question. This isn't, in my view, a white or black issue. You know, transformation in this country is not only something that black people should be worried about. Transformation in this country is something we should all be concerned about. Do you think, and we should do you, th sorry, uh, Cass, do you think that business leaders in this country have the foresight that you're talking about, right? That if you want your business to be a South African business and remain active in this country, you have to take serious transformation. When we take a look at the fact that uh, seven out of 10 directors on the JSE are white, seven out of 10 directors, uh, Cass, where are the black directors on the JSE? Um, and, and, and if those businesses that appoint those directors um, had to have the foresight, then surely it would have looked significantly different. Yeah, so, so again, I think that if you, if you break that down into companies, I think most major corporates have significant black representation on their company boards. Okay, smaller and medium-sized listed companies might have more difficulty in doing that because they don't have the sort of uh, uh, development capacity that bigger corporates would have. So I think that we need to barrel down into these figures a little bit, and we need to understand where the weaknesses are and how we deal with those weaknesses. It's not weaknesses across the board. Okay, so so I, I think that, and and you know, Sankey says that because of the way some of the, the, the verification agencies have behaved, the figures might not be worth the paper they're written on. Well, you know, the Sanlam figures are verified by Empower Dex and by Clutham. These are major respected companies. And, and if verification agencies are conducting themselves in a way that makes it very difficult for us to actually have this debate because we might not be having the proper data, then they must be acted against. Yeah. Uh, okay. You know, the law must take its course because we can't say, well, we can't do anything because we don't have the capacity to do anything. Then how seriously are we taking transformation? Yeah. Uh, Hanki, I'm going to give you the last bite here. We literally have less than a minute left before we close off the show. In 2020, when COVID hit uh, the world, the president had announced a loan guarantee scheme through the banks available for businesses. Black businesses struggled the most to access that loan guarantee scheme. Why is that? Yeah, the, the, the challenge was the, the, the criteria. So, for example, the criteria was saying uh, you must not be listed in the credit bureaus, uh, you must have been operating for a certain period, 
And remember, you are coming from COVID, where most of the small businesses uh, in general did not have the balance sheet. So what happens? If, if you don't have income coming, you won't have uh, uh, anything to pay with expenses. So, But the government guaranteed the loan, right? So it means that uh, the collateral requirement should have been far lower than what they are. No, no, I think I think it, I think it was it was almost like a public relations exercise. The the requirements were still the there. same. Yeah, the same or even even much much tougher because if you are in a crisis like COVID, you can't say someone must not be listed, must be in good standing, and, and then to be in good standing, you must not have missed an installment at some stage. So who, who's going to qualify? It's only okay. people who've got the, the the balance sheet. Unfortunately, it was not necessarily. Uh, conceptualized properly. Yeah. Uh, there, there was nothing wrong with the scheme, but I think the, the requirements were just a bit tough. Yeah, we're well, going to have to leave it there. Kesko Vario of Business Unity South Africa, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Matabane of the Black Business Council, thank you so much. And that brings us to the end of the show. We will bring you another installment of Democracy 30 next week, uh, so please do be with us at 8 p.m. If you miss any part of this episode, you can find it on the SABC News YouTube channel. My name is Oliver Dixon. Good night.